spend four days in Teen University, so I figured that was long enough to go without accidentally offending everyone I go to school with. Hi, I'm Alex, I'm 18, I read way too much YA, and in the confusion that is starting virtual COVID university, I forgot to plan out a video yet again. So today we're going to do a book tag that is applicable to me and me alone. So welcome to sharing my first impressions of all of my courses through the books that they remind me of. The tag. Also, just a side note, if somehow one of my professors manages to see this, which I don't think will happen, but if it does, you all seem wonderful so far. Um, if I'm confused by your class, it is most definitely my fault. I am just very, very dumb. Alright, so the first syllabus I opened was my linguistics syllabus, and I'm actually really kind of vibing with my ling class so far. It's very fun, very interesting, but even the upper year ling majors that I've talked to when I was trying to choose my courses and be like, hey, what is linguistics? Can't actually give me a solid definition on what linguistics is. So our first prompt is number one, a book that you enjoyed even though you never fully knew what was going on. So for me this is definitely gonna be the tell you was the time war. It's a time travel book about time traveling lesbians. <laughs> it's gorgeous and poetic and has all these references to old literature and old philosophers and a bunch of things that I never fully understood because this book is a lot smarter than me. I also had to read it twice just because of how poetically it is written to understand that one of our lesbians is a plant person, which was just wild, but it's beautiful and it's so good and I loved it even though I never fully had the complete grasp of what was going on and I think that's okay. The vibe is nice. Next was my drama class, which is also the first live university course I ever attended and the first Zoom university lecture I ever attended. Very cool class. Very cool professor and classmates. First thing we did was watch a play version of Frankenstein with Benedict Cumberbatch in it and it was interesting. <laughs> I'm um, like very very weird but very very enjoyable. I know I should have disliked it because it was like very weird and made me uncomfortable but like in a very good way. We loved it. It was great. I also started in the middle of that very first lecture of my very first university course choking on my coffee in the middle of it and kind of almost shoved my computer off the table in a desperate attempt to hide my choking from the camera because my camera was turned on which was you know not a good way to introduce myself to a group of people and all logic says that I shouldn't be enjoying this class so far but I'm having a really great time. So number two is a book that's kind of a mess and objectively you shouldn't like it but you love it anyway. For this we're going to talk about the initial insult which I received a voice galley for. So if you don't know what a voice galley is I found out what it is recently. Basically it's kind of like an advanced reader copy but for an audiobook. And what they do is and sometimes the narration isn't perfected or the narrators haven't finished actually narrating it yet so they'll synthetically produce a narrator for the audiobook which is just even more of a reason that I shouldn't have enjoyed this as much as I did and I feel like it's very on brand for this prompt. So the initial insult is a retelling of the short story The Cask of Amontillado which I'm so sure I mispronounced I'm actually gonna put the word on the screen just because like you might not have known what I was trying to say. Very sorry. Which if you didn't know is basically about this guy who's like you've offended me a ton of times. So he lures this other guy who's in a gesture classroom, which was called back in the book, which I thought was very, very cool, into this room, or I forget where they are, and he chains them to a wall. And he's like, yeah, I'm just gonna steal you up here in this wall, and people are gonna discover your body later. How do you adapt that to be a YA novel, you ask? Very good question, but Minnie McGuinness did it beautifully. I don't want to say a lot because this is the kind of book that like it's the best if you have no idea what's going on going in, but I will say this book has three perspectives, one of which belongs to Felicity who is our popular it girl with a secret that she's hiding from all the other popular it kids. Our next perspective belongs to Tress who was Felicity's best friend when they were kids but they had a falling out after Tress's parents mysteriously disappeared one night well, they were with Felicity, and Tress is sure Felicity knows what happened and just isn't telling anyone. And the third belongs to a panther. So Tress wants to find out what happened to her parents, obviously. And Felicity hasn't been telling her, so naturally the only thing to do is to lure her into the basement of a party one night on Halloween when she's dressed up as a clown. Gesture reference, we love it. And then she knocks out Felicity, she chains her up to a mineshaft, and she's like, I'm gonna seal you up in this mineshaft if you don't tell me what happened to my parents. Which, you know, is a lot. We switch between the memories of the girls when they were friends, after they were friends, and the present where they are in this basement at this party. And also, that panther perspective, what's that doing? You'll have to read it to find out. 
I love this book so much. It's a duology and the ending killed me. The next book doesn't come out until 2022. So if anyone wants to also give me an early copy of that, that'd be really, really appreciated. Thanks. Next up, we have my psychology course, which everyone keeps saying is one of the hardest courses they're in. But since we've mainly just covered the history of psychology and like how to study properly, which I took the AP Psych exam two years ago and the AP Psych exam book, that's the first chapter. And when I got the book, I was like, I'm going to be so smart and read all these chapters like 20 times. I did not but I read that first chapter 20 times. So I basically know everything that we did this week. So I'm able to sit there while everyone's freaking out and being like, what are, this is so easy, I got it. I'm sure I'm gonna discover that the course actually is super, super hard, like literally next week. But as of right now, I feel super smart. I am pretty dang cool for knowing things and being less confused and swamped by the workload than everyone else. So number three is what is a book that makes you feel smart? I talked about this two weeks ago in my wrap up, which I'll link somewhere, but I've been staying away from George Orwell's Animal Farm for a very long time because so I was like, it's going to be gory and heavy and just very intellectual and I don't want to deal with that. But it's actually now one of my favorite classics. I figured it'd be super dark and gritty, but it's more dark humor than it is grit, which is how I like my political message books. But a lot of other people have that same assumption I did where it's like this really heavy long book when it's actually really, really short. And it's still, it deals with heavy subject matter, but it deals with it in a kind of funny way that makes it more consumable, at least for me, because that is how I deal with things that are heavy. So I'm able to act all intellectual and be like, I read this really hard to read book when I actually just enjoyed and was entertained by reading it while also being educated. Very, very cool. Now we're going to talk about my Canadian history course. History is cool. Don't get me wrong, but I'm taking the course because I am in a teaching program. So like I'm getting a degree in teaching and then I'm getting a degree in something else. So then I can become a teacher. If I end up teaching higher levels, I might want to be a history teacher, which means I have to take Canadian history because I live in Canada. And here's the thing, like history is great. If you like history, that's super great. I think history is really interesting. Um, Canadian history isn't. <laughs> We're a baby country, we haven't done much. Unlike other baby countries, like our neighbors to the south who just start crap with everyone, we haven't really done much since we became our own country. And because of that, you're basically just taught the same points over and over and over again throughout your entire grade school education, high school education in Canadian history. And when I'm looking at the course catalog of history courses, I'm like, wow, if I didn't want to teach history, I, I could be learning about like the Russian Revolution or ancient Greek societies or just things that have more unique information that I haven't been getting shoved down my throat for the last like eight-ish years of my life. Kind of upsetting. But then I rolled into class and our professor was just like, hey, we're actually going to be studying modern day issues like COVID-19 and how that relates to similar events in history. And we're putting an emphasis on the Black Lives Matter movement as it pertains to Canadian history. And it's just like, not what I was expecting to be at all. I'm actually interested in the topics, which I was dreading the course. And yeah, very cool. I'm really, really excited. So number four is, is there a book you were just low key, not looking forward to that you ended up really enjoying? I used Animal from Marty, which would have been my answer for this. So instead we're going to go with The Invincible Summer and Juniper Jones which I actually gave a better rating than Animal Farm, I think. I know I gave Animal Farm a 14.5 out of 17. I think I gave The Invincible Summer either a 15 or a 16 out of 17. So I guess it earns a spot anyway. Basically, the story behind me reading this book is I it was right when I started reading and reviewing advanced review copies, and I received an ERF of this. It is out now, though, I think. I'll put the release date on screen if it's not, because this is a wonderful book. Everyone should read it. And basically that week, I would requested a bunch of arcs from Wattpad books, and I'd read in that day, the day before, and the day before that, bunch of arcs from Wattpad books. I read three other ones and I did not enjoy any of them. Now I was about to give up on requesting Wattpad arcs and I was like I might as well just read this one. I already have it. Let's see how it goes. And oh my god was it incredible. I described this jury's finale to Stargirl if Stargirl tackled racial prejudice and racism in 1950s Alabama, which might seem like a weird comparison, but if you've read the book, I feel like it works. It makes sense. So this book follows Ethan, who's half white, half black, who is raised primarily by his white father in a more progressive area. We're still in the 1950s, so it's not like crazy progressive, but because that his father's never really had to confront the racism that Ethan's mom would have faced and the racism that Ethan is likely to face, Ethan gets in some trouble at school and his dad's like, how would I go send you to live like your aunt and uncle in Alabama in the 1950s, which, you know, 
not a good place to send your biracial kid. So in Alabama, Ethan starts facing like really, really serious racism for one of the first times in his life. Everyone, even if they're trying, is really, really bad at dealing with the fact that he is a biracial kid. Then enter Juniper Jones, who is also kind of an outcast in town and decides that they are going to be BFFs and they're going to have the best summer humanly possible. Juniper Jones is the reason I made the Stargirl comparison because she gives me a lot of the same character vibes that Jerry Spinelli's Stargirl did, but in the same way, as Jerry Spinelli Stargirl. If I were to describe her, it sounds like she's Manic Pixie when she is this very developed character and she's this character that you can really relate to and really root for and you can really root for Ethan through his relationship with Juniper Jones. Anyways, <laughs> this book really hurt my feelings and because I am a cruel person, I want your feelings to be hurt too so I am not alone. You should 100% read it. Next up, we're gonna talk about my English class. You're watching a video of me talking about books on my channel where I talk about books I like books. I was excited for English class. I looked through the read list and it was incredible. Most of what we're reading is stuff you consider classics, but there is just such a huge amount of feminist reads on there as well as reads by queer authors who were like, out, not authors who speculate are queer, like authors from history who had boyfriends and girlfriends of the same sex. Very, very cool. Wasn't expecting that, so I was even more excited. But this is definitely the class that suffers the most, at least for me, from the fact that I am studying off campus and virtually because of COVID. It's definitely not the prop's fault because it's my most detailed syllabus. Theoretically, it should be the easiest for me to follow along with this class, but I am so lost, oh my god. I think it's a combination of me just being one, just very bad technology. Two, my textbooks came today, which means I did this first week without the textbooks. Luckily, our first read was something I have read before and I found my copy of it from before. So I was totally fine, but you know, kind of stressful to have bits and pieces of the information now that I have it all I hope it's less confusing. My first impression is still that I was really really confused. So number five is a book that you were looking forward to that ended up confusing and slash or disappointing you. This is going to be Ninth House by Lee Vardugo, which I was so pumped for. You can't watch booktube and not have been pumped for Ninth House to come out. Everyone was talking about it. I read it later because I read it at my library, got it because I am broke. And I, at that point, had heard mixed reviews, but I was still pretty pumped. I was extra hyped because I am a narcissist and the main character's the same name as me. I like reading books where the characters have the same name as me. Leave me alone. Um, my name is not Galaxy. My name is Alex. I should have made that clear. I wish it was Galaxy. Now I can lie and say it's short for Galaxy. That's pretty cool. But yeah, I'm a narcissist, so I was so excited. I think my main problems were both how info dumpy the world was making things not even really confusing, but they explain it in so much detail that I was confused as to why there was that much detail. And also the fact that the pacing was kind of a mess. Basically, everything in this book happens at the exact same pace, regardless of how important of a scene it is. Which means if Alex is walking around for an hour, looking at all the buildings in the and describing them in detail, we get the same roughly amount of words and page length as we do when Alex is fighting a bunch of bad guys at this book's climax. And it made it both like very unenjoyable, things were either too fast or too slow, nothing really felt like it was at the right pace. I definitely did not enjoy this and I was very let down. So next up is my class where they teach us how to be a teacher. We haven't really done that much in this class so far beyond just like have a get to know you session and learn basic information about the course, which is super cool. I'm very glad that I kind of started with a much lighter course load. That was fun. But everything we have done just has the most chillest, wholesomest vibe. Teaching kids are the nicest kids you will ever meet. I feel like I've infiltrated this club of like really really good people and I hope they don't find out that I low-key have a kind of garbage personality but it's great. I love them. Amazing. I've literally never been in a less intimidating Zoom call. Like it was a party. It was great. We loved it. 18 out of 17 would recommend. So number six is what's a book with add a lot of substance that you loved anyways because it's just so freaking cute. For me, this is definitely, definitely, definitely Date Me Bryson Keller. Date Me Bryson Keller is the most fanfiction thing I have read in a very, very, very long time. It has all the tropes. It has fake dating. It has, I am a little nerd and he's a big football star. It quite literally feels like something that you would read on fanfic.net or on Wattpad or on Archive of Our Own. And that's why I think I loved it so much because for a very long time, and I think still now, fanfiction was one of the few artistic spaces that was able to vocally be dominated mostly by queer voices and by queer stories. Like a lot of the other arts are very queer but that was something you'd have to hide in like fan fiction because of the anonymity behind it. A lot of the stories were queer and a lot of the places were like the oh we're just fake dating ha 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 unless tropes and stuff like that came from likely originated or were refined by queer stories. Like this was the kind of cliche sweet story that I'd read in secret when I was like 
12. And being able to read this kind of sweet story, which I found on the front page of my library's virtual e-library, which I know bookstores and Goodreads and everywhere was advertising the crap out of, and that, like, the publisher is advertising the crap out of, just made me so happy. And I was crying, but not at the sad parts, I was crying more at the happy parts, so this book has sad parts. So the fact that books like that are allowed to thrive and are allowed to become so publicly accessible just made me really, really, really happy, and oh, I love this book so much. That's it! Thank you for watching uh, my chaotic book tag that isn't really actually a book tag, it was just me wanting to talk about university so far. I don't know how to tag people here. My last video I did tag and I was like, let me know if you want to be tagged. Obviously, I can't tag everyone in talking about my university experience, although if you want, I will put the prompts I use in the description. It just might be hard to explain to an audience what those prompts pertain to. But I will say, this was so much fun to just think about how to describe my classes in a way that could work as a book prompt. So if you are in university or high school or middle school or elementary school, whatever school, if you are in a school or if you are even a teacher and you're legally allowed to and wanted to do this with your own classes, I think that'd be so hilarious. Please comment your video if you end up doing that because I really want to see that. And yeah, thank you for watching my video. Are any of you in kind of weird virtual class situations or work situations? Let me know how that's going for you and what challenges you face so far and what you've been liking about it so far. For me personally, when the classes went online last year for like high school and stuff, I found that my grades spiked massively because while I really like learning information and I'm fairly good at retaining information, I can't recall that information very well in a classroom setting because I'm very easily distractible. So it was really really cool to be able to control things about my environment like the lighting and background noise because stuff like that normally really really bothers me in tests and that was something i wasn't expecting to enjoy about online learning so that was really cool silver linings are fun the downside is when i get into actual university lecture halls i might be even more distractible so can't wait <laughs> What about you? Have you found any of those kind of silver linings out of the mess that is the world right now? Please feel free to like, comment, and subscribe, and I will see you next Tuesday-ish. Bye.